Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Military Mutterings, where I, Jack Fletcher, and my good friend, me, Kevin Johnson, will be discussing a very interesting topic that I am most looking forward to sharing with you all, and I'm sure Kevin is as well. <laughs> well, a very iconic topic, I would say. Yes, but also one that is shrouded in a lot of mystery and misconception, which we hope to break some of. <laughs> or, if that doesn't work, we will simply reinforce it. But yes. But whatever the case, here we have the ME-163 Comet. The Explosive Record Breaker. <laughs> now, Kevin, why did we put the Explosive Record Breaker? Well, it's sort of down to the fuel, really. I'm, I'm not going to go into great depth uh, about the fuel, because I don't know enough about science to even sort of tell you about this stuff, but let's just say it was extremely dangerous and like, highly flammable. Even when they refueled the aircraft properly and safely, the, it, there was still a chance of it, it just blowing up on the, on the runway somewhere. Mm. Was it not that the comet got its power from the... Uh from the uh, volatile reaction that happened with its propulsion. Yeah, it had two types of fuel. I forgot the names actually, but one of them was, it was a C type and a T type, if I'm correct. And then those two will be separately fueled into the aircraft. And to show just how dangerous it was, they had two um, fueling ports, one for the uh, one type and one for the other. So they, you just didn't want to mix this on the runway while you're refueling it. It, it was just so dangerous. And actually, well, I wanted to say funny story, but actually a very sad story. One pilot actually died on the ground when the aircraft just decided to, well, blow up. And the pilot was disintegrated. There was just nothing left of him. Like, everything down to the bone was just burned away or exploded away. Mm. Like, it's very nasty stuff that powered this thing. But it did make it very fast. And I guess maybe you can t t talk about the record-breaking side of this. Yes, well, before I do that, I will actually tell you now that the uh, propellant used was called Sea Stop, which combined methanol and hydrazine hydrate. <laughs> and then the Sea Stop was oxidized with a hydrogen peroxide based solution called E Stop. Now, you see, <laughs> I don't know anything about science, but that stuff doesn't sound like the stuff you want to be mixing up. Doesn't sound the kind of thing you want to go and have a nice sip of in yeah. the uh, late <laughs> evening hours. So yes, let us um, move on. Uh, Kevin, can you uh, let us, us commence on to the forth mighty, the A variant and might as well list some of the uh, records this aircraft broke. Now, this aircraft, although it had a very limited fuel capacity was able to reach easily over 300 miles an hour it was higher than that yeah the, it's uh, much higher on, actually on the 2nd of October 1941 one of the uh, ME163As which you see before you pretty much set a new world speed record of 1004 kilometers an hour at 624 miles an hour yes and that record was only broken after the war by uh, an American Douglas D-558-1. I don't know which plane that is exactly, but only post-war they actually managed to break the uh, speed record this one set. Yes, broken only by the uh, Sky Street, which was uh, rather intriguing actually. And in terms of, uh, well, let's just say, how by how much it was broken, it was only broken very it wasn't even broken by much. It was broken by, I believe, 16 miles an hour. <laughs> or 26 miles. No, 16 miles an hour, yes. It uh, propelled to 640 miles an hour on, in, well, in 1947. So. Yeah, that, that's about 30 kilometers an hour higher. <laughs> yes, and almost six years later. Bloody hell. I guess. There's something we should probably mention what the uh, ME163A is a little bit more. So this was just the, the first sort of serial production version of it. And it is unarmed, aside from one specific one that you see before you. We'll get to that in just a little bit. So all the regular A's were unarmed. And they had this rather 
well, big nose, I want to say. When you look at the other ME163s, uh, they all look much sleeker, but the, the Aces look like this. <laughs> a more of a bulbous protrusion. Yeah, exactly. And basically the A's, because they were unarmed, were not used in, in any sort of military well, attacks, and they were just kept for training purposes. So uh, a very, very um, brave pilot would take this one out to see if how the uh, comet would um, respond. <laughs> but yeah. this, the specific variant we looked at in front of us was this one of the A's was given the uh, R4M unguided rockets. Mm, and used on the ME163. Sorry, the ME two six two. Yeah, yeah, the two six two. Well, also on the one six three A. You're not wrong. Yeah, let's see. Something interesting I found about these rockets: they had about the same velocity of the thirty millimeter MK one hundred eight. So again, this comes to show a great sort of training purpose. So they, they would just have these rockets on that had the same velocity as the guns they were later going to use, so pilots could get used to um, how to actually handle the weaponry and how to fire the guns properly. Mm, yes, and considering the um, those same 30mm cannons, they weren't very high velocity, were they? No, they were very low velocity. I think we we'll actually go on into the B variant right now, considering we're talking yes, mostly we about the weaponry. Well. Yes, so here we have a B variant, and what we can see, of course, is big change in the nose. Yeah. Yes, it's much more sleek. It's still got no landing gear, but this time round it's actually got a retractable sort of sled for landing <laughs> purposes. It's sort of a because, skid, really. Yes, the uh, two gear, the um, are known as a, uh, well, well, nicknamed dolly gear, they fall off, they are not retractable, what's the word I'm looking for? Disposable. So, basically, the 163 takes off, and the landing gear, aside from the rear wheel, which retracts up, falls off. And upon landing, you have this little skid. But yeah, so you have the uh, nose. What was that propeller used for, if I ask you? Yeah, I was about to go actually say that. So a lot of people just like to make a little meme like that that's an additional little engine <laughs> for the aircraft to get going. But it's actually the opposite. That one will basically just be spinning as the uh, comet will be soaring through the sky. And it, was, it would actually be charging up the backup battery that would be powering all of the systems inside of the aircraft. And actually, yeah, when, when you think about it, regular piston aircraft have, uh, well, just the petrol engines running around and they can charge batteries. But a rocket engine, not so much. You're just combining fuel together. It's not easy to sort of generate power off of that. So they had to have a secondary system mounted in the nose to power the uh, electricity. I think that is quite a, quite a good way to solve it, really. Yes, now I believe that in the image here is a B1, I believe. Yes, so. I do believe it's a B1, yes. Yes, because the B0... And in case people don't got... know, the, uh, the Zero is basically, basically like a pre-production series. Yes, and the only main difference is really the fact that the B0 was armed with a pair of 20mm MG151 slash 20 cannons with 100 rounds per gun. Whereas the B1 variant, which is the main variant that saw service, was armed with a pair of 30mm MK106 cannons with only 60 rounds per gun. However, on saying that, this aircraft, now considering it had very limited ammunition, so very limited flight time, you know, you would fly up and then having expended all of its fuel, would glide down onto a bomb formation, go pew pew for a little bit, and then glide back down for safety. This aircraft was able to, not this one in particular, but maybe this one in particular. <laughs> oh, maybe, yeah. But the B-1 was able to shoot down 9 to 18 Allied aircraft with only 10 losses, which were mostly from ground accidents. Yeah, I mean... If they fixed the whole fuel problem, that would have probably been brought down to maybe one or two losses. So yes. n 9 to 18, let's just say 14 um, kills against two losses, that's really not bad. Mm, yes, and not only that, um, a couple of these aircraft were armed with the Jagdfaust Morton. <laughs> and this system, which I have been edging to talk about, 
is essentially unguided rockets in the fuselage of the aircraft pointing upwards. And whenever it would pass underneath a bomber, these rockets would fire. And I believe only one aircraft was ever downed with such a system. Yeah, I believe that is correct. And I, I think that was on a Focke-Wulf 190 that actually did it. How oh, was it? I thought it was with an ME-163. No, like they, they tested it on uh, a couple of different aircraft, including the 190, but it could have been a Comet, actually. But mm. so, something I can add to the Yachtfaust, um, on the Comet, if you're soaring through the sky at 1,000 kilometers an hour, you're not going to be able to time it properly to fire the, uh, the mortars. So I believe they had a small little camera system that when it would become very dark, so the plane would be under an aircraft and there was no sunlight, they would fire. So yes, it was just like computer controlled. But it does... Yes, I believe that's how the system worked. It does sort of come to show that this would only work during the day. But I guess that makes sense since the Americans did their bombing raids during the day, so... Yes, because that was such a successful tactic that the British used. <laughs> And they wonder why we stopped doing uh, like, uh, daylight raids when their losses started mounting. However, that is a topic for another day. Now, what we need to remember is that over 300 of these aircraft were built. So that's no small number. And although they were in a, essentially a bit disposable, let's be honest, I mean, this was towards the end of the war things really got going and let's say over 300 built quite disposable however although that wouldn't change in the next variant we're going to talk about that would change in the d variant but before we get to that kevin can you guide us through the me163c Ooh, i i very much can so the ME-163C was basically going to fix one issue that the ME-163s had, and that was range. So here, they were just going to give the ME-163 a larger wing and make the fuselage slightly longer, and that would give it a whole lot more fuel. And I think a standard ME-163B had about 4 minutes of flight time, if I'm correct. But then again, you can glide around a little bit too, but like just fuel burning, you can go for like 4 minutes. This one would actually be able to go about 10 to 12 minutes of just flying straight up on fuel. So that is a huge improvement, really. Hmm. But also... Hmm? So I was just going to say that um, although a C variant was built, the reason why we haven't put the picture in is because it does not look like what is blueprinted here. It actually looks incredibly similar, if not identical, to a B variant, the one that was built. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit obscure. But I think the whole thing about it, like, there are very subtle differences between engines, which we've not talked about in this video, also mainly because I don't really know the differences. But I believe yeah. the C was going to have a slightly different and more powerful engine. And I think what happened is they they just took a regular B and gave it that new engine, but they kept the fuselage and everything the same. So And they just called it a C variant. So. It is a C variant, it did flew, it had a different engine, but it wasn't the whole fuselage that was the C variant, it was just the engine. So I think that's sort of where it came from. But yeah, if you look it up, you can find an, just a regular looking ME163, and that one actually being the C version. Yes, and I suppose another thing they improved upon here in this blueprint is the um, pilot's visibility, as we can see from the better cockpit. Yeah, I was uh, I was about to mention it. It sort of, re it, it really resembles something like an ME262, you know? When when you look at the when you look at the B versions, the cockpit is just sort of flush into the fuselage, and that really hinders your uh, visibility when you look backwards. Then again, when you are a comet, I don't really think you're going to have any trouble with anybody on your six. But still, having this much more aerodynamic and better looking cockpit that 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 does go a long way, I think. But I think that is well. I guess I can t touch upon the armament. Um, pretty much, it was going to stay the same. So two 30mm MK108 cannons, or if it's possible, two 20mm MG151 cannons. But yeah, mm -hmm. sadly the, the actual C variant that you see on the blueprint before you was never really built, so that's just sort of where the story ends. But it just it comes to show where they try to increase the range. But that still leaves one problem, of course, and that is the whole landing and takeoff, and that is where the 163D comes in. 
this aircraft does away with the whole skid style because the skid was awful, <laughs> terrifying to utilize. <laughs> I'm certain if one was asked to land a aircraft with such highly volatile fuel that even the absence of the fuel, as long as there were a few drops left in the actual fuselage, could blow you up on landing. You know, if you were asked to land an aircraft on that on a skid, on a bumpy <laughs> runway, or on a field somewhere, I'm sure one would not be too pleased, no matter how fanatical they are about a failing regime. The D, however, solves this with retractable landing gear. And not only that, but a generally increased fuselage length to allow for an increased fuel capacity. I believe it was also going to be about 10 to 12 minutes of flight Yeah, I think it's um, it sort of combines the C variant, but then with... Um... Well, it really combines the C variant and a B variant because you can see the photo is not the best in the world, but you can see there's a B version cockpit <laughs> yes. with a longer now, fuselage and retractable gear. I don't think this aircraft was armed. No, I do believe the prototype was uh, unarmed. But then again, yeah. the guns would be mounted there in the wing roots, and that's not very visible on this photo. I believe there's mm. some cloth going over the wings, so it's really not visible whatsoever. But and more importantly as well, we cannot tell from the cloth whether or not the, the uh, cockpit problem was fixed. I'm going to assume it wasn't. No, I, I believe this one is just a B fuselage, but then lengthened. And given retractable landing gear. Yeah. I do. Also, the wings were moved further to the back to um, keep it stable, to keep the center of gravity in the right place. So there were quite some modifications done to the fuselage here. Yes, in fact, it's almost as if they had uh, considered um, this to be a more economical and sustainable aircraft and not some disposable tool, as if this yeah. aircraft could be reused better. So instead of it being only a chance the aircraft could be reused from, from it crashing and blowing up on landing, that this aircraft would be able to be reused on numerous missions rather than maybe one or two before the plane blew up from simply existing. Yeah, if you look back to the C version, so this one was sort of very revolutionary, like a completely new, brand new, sleek design. But it was too late in the war, if you think about it, too modern, and they had the production lines already going with the old fuselages, they couldn't quickly change it. So I think that's where the D version came in, reusing a same older fuselage, but incorporating some of the ideas that the C version brought. Hmm. And even some ideas of its own. Yeah, if they maybe maybe they should have gone on and made an E version <laughs> where they combine ideas of the C and the D together into one. Yeah, you get the sleek design Schrager. with retractable gear. Yes, and a Schrager music system and a tail gunner. <laughs> ah, Pond yes. Load, why not? Yes, that uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, well, considering we are discussing the ME one six three, an aircraft which in of itself makes very little sense. <laughs> and I think we're going to go into the next last funny looking version. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. I've been excited for this. I've been excited <laughs> for all the variants, but this this isn't some Soviet variant. This is captured by the Soviets, but this is the 163 S. <laughs> this is and I dare say the two seater trading bird. <laughs> As if putting one little soldier in wasn't enough. Now you can put two of them. <laughs> well, it sort of makes sense in a way, because Russia captured a lot of the equipment uh, Russia, uh, Germany had at the end of the war. And Russia... Well, let's just say Russia has been a big fan of experimenting with rocket-powered things. Look no further than the BI uh, rocket interceptor plane they have. Yeah. So I guess I here... Just... Uh, what? So I interrupt, but did, I, I don't think they lengthened the fuselage at all, did they? No, I was, I was about to mention it later on, but like, I think the second pilot is sitting on top of the engine. Like, the engine is all the way in the rear there, and fuel capacity oh, cannot have been increased a whole lot either, so I, I yeah. Increased, it would have probably had to have been decreased. Yeah, it, it would have been you decreased. Have another person there, and you need room for that other person. That. <sighs> It's Good the Russians, Lord. you know. <laughs> it's not the Russians, it's the Germans. That, that, that's a... 
bloody hell is all I can say <laughs> when looking at this monstrosity of an aircraft. It's quite clearly just a B variant with another piece stuck on top. No idea if it was armed or not. It probably was. Yeah, I, I think I think the Russians just used this to test out the 163s and train some pilots, considering they yeah. probably wanted to reuse this sort of rocket power technology for yeah, themselves. Yeah, so not only that, but in German uh, usage, they probably would have kept the guns in it, purely on the basis of it could be used as a last-ditch effort fighter. But like, I, I don't know if this is actually a German version or not. Maybe the Russians made this 2C oh, trainer. Oh, this is German. Oh, is it German? 2C trainer is, was a German variant. Oh. Well, the more this you know. So happens to be captured by the Russians. <laughs> so that we've covered the German ones, we've co we covered the captured Russian ones. It only leaves one behind, really. Aside from the ones in British Museum. Yeah, aside from those ones and the replica. But now we've got the Kai two hundred, or the uh, the Mitsubishi J eight K, if I'm uh, correct. Because there were technically two different versions, one for the army, one for the navy. Everyone like... and their bloody kitchen sink had one of these. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's sort of like a Japanese improvised version of it. Like Germany sold the plans of the ME-163 to Japan. And then the Japanese sort of had to... Um... Well, no, wasn't there like... Germany sent two submarines containing the plans for the ME-163 to Japan, but one of them was lost. Mm, so Japan just so. had to sort of continue with what they had. Sort of had to make deal, I suppose. Yeah. Like, the biggest changes here that we can point out is, well, the lack of the little propeller at the front. So I don't know how the Japanese solved the electrical issue, maybe bigger batteries. And, mm. um, of course, the weaponry was going to be changed. I believe they had the much higher velocity 30 millimeter. Oh boy, I forgot the name. Well, they're Ho much. One five fives. Yeah, I believe it, I believe it's the whole one five fives. Yeah. Yeah. So... Still only sixty rounds though, but. Yeah, but they have a much higher velocity, so it's much easier to aim for the Japanese pilots. Yes, although I highly doubt they ever had such an ingenious track on guided rockets on. <laughs> also, I think the one we're looking at right here on this photo, yeah, sure, it's it's not colored, but I believe this this one's paint job was this bright orange. <laughs> Sounds about right. I, yeah, I, li I like that as a a super fast rocket powered plane soaring through the sky and it's just painted bright orange. <laughs> Maybe in the nose there was a retractable sword. So after you've <laughs> expended all of your ammunition, you could go on a Kamikaze run and physically slice a B 29's tail off. <laughs> but, like, to be fair, Japan was having the same issues Germany was with bombing raids, just destroying everything. So, having a super fast interceptor like this w would help. But, like, in the end, oh. in, the, in the end, Japan didn't manage to build as many as Germany did, sadly. So, it didn't did really. Did any of us think service? I believe a couple of them did, or they, they were just tested by going after a bomber, <laughs> like Japan would like to do so here and there. But. They, they, they didn't really make a, make a big mark on history, sadly. One of my questions is, if, you, if that's the way you test an aircraft, by going after a bomber, what if it gets shot down? <laughs> well, is, I is it deemed a failure? Because, oh lord, that bomber just so happens to have defensive gunners. <laughs> well, also in typical Japanese fashion, it was considered to use this as a kamikaze plane at the end of the war course again back to what i was saying with a samurai sword it's, it's possible <laughs> i wouldn't be surprised really yes or but maybe I, uh... it had a um an orca um well you mean the 1200 kilogram bomb in the nose yes maybe maybe uh, maybe they could um maybe they could have just swept the rings back a little bit and just uh, said it was one of those yeah exactly yeah, then again, there was good. also an inter well, there's supposedly an interceptor version of the Oka, oh, with like two yeah. twenty millimeter cannons. But I guess that's a topic for another day. <laughs> yes, and let's hope we never have to revisit that topic because I don't think my sanity or <laughs> lack thereof would be able to cope. Yeah, well, I think we've covered everything on the ME one six three, haven't we? Yes, might as well just add a last couple of little, little facts to say. Over 300 were built, 
first flight September uh, 1st September 1941 and was accepted into service in 1944 so only a year of service like really if that considering well yes a year if that and still what is impressive a almost six seven year flight record that was only barely broken exported to the japanese technically speaking captured by the soviets a couple of <laughs> museums around the world i believe there's one in the imperial War museum london because when i went to the Duxford imperial war museum last Oh, never mind, that's why it wasn't there, because it was sold for the purchase of a de Havilland DH-9. <laughs> Sounds... You... Well, wasn't that one... I think you're talking about the bright red ME-163, right? I don't know, but you're going to sell an ME-163 for a bloody biplane. Are you mental? Well, it's, uh, priorities, man. Some people have very weird priorities. Definitely priorities. Look, a biplane, many varieties were built. Here's a rocket aircraft that exploded by existing. <laughs> like, yeah. I believe the bright red replica is actually unpowered, so it was just a glider. But it is a very good-looking oh, replica, yeah. I'll be honest. Yes, even if it's if it wasn't a replica, I'll be very concerned for the man flying it. <laughs> But I think we're getting a bit off topic here. Yes, we are definitely getting a bit off, off, off topic. Um, <laughs> so, are there any final thoughts you would like to bring before I launch into another round? <sighs> no, not really. I think we've covered about all the important stuff for the ME163. Yes, well, all of the um, all of the basic important stuff. There's numerous other tidbits we could go into, but we will be here for a lot longer, and I would just get angrier and angrier knowing me. Well, I think in the However, meantime, we've made our longest video yet now, so... <laughs> probably, yes. Uh, well, what I will say is, stay tuned for next week. Because next week, as our 10th episode, we will be discussing a battle. So how we will be doing military mutterings is it will be tank, ship, plane, tank, ship, plane, tank, ship, plane, and then a battle. And next week's battle, I might as well say, we will be analysing... Well, not analyzing but discussing <laughs> the battle of the drawback sound or as i like to call it how to lose your advanced modern cruiser to an antiquated fortress <laughs> system <laughs> yes. so until then friends have you stopped recording yet no oh fair enough just, just like edit it out when I say the end bit, I suppose. Well, we don't have an outro yet. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like, okay, so you were saying the battle of the whatever sea, how to lose your cruiser, and let's now just stop it with like, well, anyways. Goodbye. <laughs> bye. K. <Okay>, bye. <laughs> yes. Goodbye. See you next week, friends.